Can you give a few examples where Jesus uses Jewish doctrines developed in Second Temple period that are not explicit in the Old Testament? Well, that, that, that's an interesting juxtaposition, juxtaposition in light of what I just said. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you do have broadly, I brought up Satan. Again, the, the, the full picture of Satan is going to be different. Uh, you know, in Second Temple and New Testament, but but to be more specific, you know, to to the question, examples where Jesus uses Jewish doctrines. Again, I would I'd quibble with the wording. I mean, Jesus isn't looking to use Jewish doctrines, but he he's he's going to be part of 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 the world, part of a world, you know, that that has connected these dots. And the, and the dots come from the Old Testament, but they're not connected in the Old Testament, they're connected later. So I think that's a, even that is a helpful way to think about it. But here's a, here are a couple of examples. The phrase in Matthew 25, 41, about the lake of fire being prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, that is, is an idea, this, uh, the association of this place of torment, place of punishment, you know, that might, you know, be eschatological across the board, but to associate it specifically with the devil and his angels, as though the devil has a bunch of angels that work for him. Okay, that's not something you're going to find in the Old Testament. You're going to find the devil, the Satan figure. You're going to find other fallen, uh, you know, divine beings that would be on the same team, as it were, with Satan. But you're not going to find verses that actually specifically connect them like Satan is the captain and here's his team. You're also not going to find uh, this description that specifically the afterlife uh, place of punishment, the one that's sort of made permanent, you know, this this lake of fire thing that we see that at the end of, of the final judgment you know, where they're cast into it and, and there they go. You're not going to see the underworld really cast as a lake of fire. There, there are little, there are little glimpses uh, of things like that. You certainly get the idea of punishment, where Satan is is cast down to the underworld. You certainly get that. Uh, it, Jewish tradition, which is built off of, again, not only Old Testament but also uh, Second Temple stuff, like about the, the the fallen sons of God of Genesis six one through four. Since the Apkalu, which is the original Mesopotamian story for those four verses, since the Apkalu wind up being imprisoned in the abyss. That's where that idea comes from. And the writer of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 sort of assumed you knew the backstory. He doesn't discuss the backstory. It gets discussed a lot later in the intertestamental period, second temple period. All that you get in the Old Testament are the Rephaim, which again are, are part of the, 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 the giant you know, thinking in Old Testament uh, theology. You see them in Sheol, but you don't ever have a verse where they're like working for Satan, like what's my job today, boss? You know, you, you never have this explicit association. You do have this place that's that that if you're left there, if you have no hope of escape, that's bad, because who's who are your neighbors now? Who are you living with? Well, you're living with the, the, the original fallen, you know, rebel of Genesis three, the Satan figure. You're also living with the, the spirits of the giant clans, which are, are demons in Second Temple thought. You, that's really not great. You know, I mean, can I can I find a better neighborhood? Well, the answer is no, because if you're left in Sheol, that means you're you're one of the unrighteous. So, again, you you have all you have these ideas, you have these data points floating around in the Old Testament, but they're never put together. And it, later on in the Second Temple period, you get the dots connected, and the dots derive from the Old Testament, and they make sense in light of what you read in the Old Testament. They're just not connected the way you're reading you know, them here in Matthew 25, 41, or in a second temple passage. It's the same thing for exorcism of demons. You don't have this in the Old Testament. In fact, you barely have the expectation of the Messiah being someone who would exorcise demons. We did a whole episode on this on the podcast. It's episode 87. Where does this expectation come from that the Messiah would be someone who would cast out demons when you have like zero reference to, to exorcism in the Old Testament? It's built off one or two, you know, things that you find in one or two Old Testament passages and that get, you know, applied in this way. You know, certain little points of language get applied to the idea of the, the, the son of David, the Davidic descendant, having power uh, over, over demons and over, over evil spirits and things like that. So it, it, there's an idea, again, Jesus obviously in the Gospels, you know, does exorcism on a number of occasions. You have the sort of the, the kernel thoughts and the data points in the Old Testament, but you have no sort of explication 
uh, of those things, of the idea. You have no, no, nothing that states these connections in the Old Testament itself, but then later on, you do during the Second Temple period on into the New Testament. So there are things like this, again, that develop. And I'll go back to my question, to the previous question. Why would we ever expect all of the biblical writers to know exactly the same things at the same times, you know, or, or, or having lived so far apart? And, you know, again, why would we have this expectation that everybody knows the same thing? Well, the, the short answer is because that's what we're taught in church. Okay, that's not the correct answer. It's not a coherent answer. Again, we, we just sort of make this assumption that everybody knows the same thing. And, th and then when, when they know it and they write something, it's, it's like all written at the same time and everybody has a Bible. You know, folks, I, I, I hate to, again, try to disabuse listeners of this idea, but it wasn't until the modern era post printing press and even then you you know you got to go a few centuries afterwards it, it's only in the modern era that you could pretty much assume that the average person despite their station in life would actually have a bible that is not true in the ancient world and so these assumptions that that we we look at biblical characters we look at biblical writers and and we sort of expect them to just be able to look something up or just to automatically know it because they're a prophet well, they, they know every, that, all that stuff that somebody else wrote because they're a prophet. Well, again, that, that doesn't make any sense. They don't have the information downloaded into their heads. Most of them will never you know, pick up a, a, anything that you could call a Bible. It's, that's, this is why prophets exist. Prophets are the oral covenant enforcers. They, this is why you have, quote, schools of the prophets in the Old Testament, so that they can share information. Uh, you know, they, they can take what is written, and it's not a whole lot, and then they can, you know, be taught by the prophet. They can pass that on because prophets need to be succeeded. Uh, this is how it works. It's not like our time when you can just look stuff up and everybody's got a Bible. It's just not the way it is.